I loved it. I'll send you a copy. Bam! Bitch went down. Welcome back to Horror Queers. We are talking vampire Pomeranians. We're talking the Patriarch of Nocturna. And we're talking Hannibal King's Tramp Stamp. I'm Joe. I'm Trace, and we're talking Parker Posey and some Dracula, oh, I mean, Drake dildos. Yes, please make sure that you are referencing the correct term. He has been modernized. He is only going by <laughs> Drake now. This movie tries so hard to be cool. Okay, we're talking Blade Trinity, y'all. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did you see this in theaters? I did, yes. And I did too. I was so disappointed. <laughs> so I liked it when I saw it. So this came out, I would have, it would have been probably my sophomore year of high school. So I would have been like 15, I think, when it came out. And I had seen the first two, like, in their TBS reruns, another one of those movies. Mm, um, cause, okay. you know, when the first one came out, I was nine years old. And for some reason, <sighs> I, I talked about how my mom was very strict about R-rated movies in the past and, like, how we weren't allowed to watch them. But for some reason, me being 15 and my sister being 13, she thought it was okay for all of us. Like, we basically asked her to go, can we go see Blade Trinity? Because Jessica Biel was in it and my sister loved Ryan Reynolds. And we were like, we'll go see it as a family. And so we went, like, on a Thursday evening to go see mm-hmm. Blade Trinity <laughs> as a family. And my mom had not even seen the first two. And I remember thinking it was really funny. I did not think that on this rewatch. No, I remember thinking that Ryan Reynolds was absolutely hysterical because I felt like I hadn't really seen this side of him before, which is also deeply weird because I used to watch that terrible TV show he was on called Two Guys and a Girl. Yeah, which I think I, for some reason, I know that we have referenced this before on the podcast. Don't know why it would have come up. I'm really confused, though. Why had you never seen the side of him before? Because he was always playing a jokester like Van Wilder even. No, but like action jokester. Oh, oh. This is really yes. wisecracker, wisecracky. This was like a more vulgar kind of side to him. Like I was used to seeing dumb idiot version of him, whereas this is jacked meathead version. Gotcha. Yeah, because this, I think Amityville Horror was the year after this. Actually, well, I think it was March after this. It was like four months later. So this was the era of buff Ryan Reynolds, and people were like going gaga over him because he was trying to prove himself. He was trying to prove that he wasn't Van Wilder anymore. Yes. Um, But I would argue that he's pretty much a buff Van Wilder in this movie. (laughs) Yes, in hindsight. At the time, I was like, oh, yeah, he's so edgy and hot and dangerous. (laughs) And now I'm just kind of like, no, he just cracks wise with some bad facial hair and a really good torso. No, he looks great. He probably comes out of this movie the cleanest in terms of like, there's no good dialogue in this movie. No. He handles his the best and probably Parker Posey because she knows what kind of movie she's in yeah but poor jessica biel and pretty much everyone else in this movie gets the worst (laughs) dialogue and jessica biel as much as i love her cannot handle i know like i drunkenly like said this last week as i slurred my way through the end of our x-files episode uh listeners apologies for that no worries i am not drinking tonight uh, and i ate dinner so uh i'll be coherent today (laughs) always a good start (laughs) this is good because it's just me i don't have anybody else to help save me (laughs) No, trust me, I I finished editing this episode last night, so everyone, this is like a week before the episode drops, and um, it's embarrassing for me, so um, don't... Aww. It's, yeah, it's not good, but it's okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, yeah. We've registered you in AA, you're going to be fine. I'll be (laughs) fine. It's going to be a dry holiday for you. I shouldn't have volunteered to edit that episode, but I really wanted it to be good. Y'all came out unscathed in that episode. Yes. So yeah, anyway. I was the Chris Christofferson of that episode. (laughs) Oh, so you were there for five minutes and then left? Yes. Actually, I think he handles himself the best because he was like, I'm going to cash this check and I'm going to get the fuck out of here. Honestly, up bef- up until before Whistler dies, it feels like the first okay. Blade movie. Yeah. Minus, minus the opening credit sequence, which... Oof. Oof, <laughs> oof, oof. I, I, I don't Do you know think what... Somebody... Do you think that somebody watched X-Men? It feels so of its time, and I feel like this going to. Yes. I feel like we're going to say that a lot today. Um, oh, because yes. this is um, Blade's fifteenth anniversary, which well, we were initially unsure about last week, and then you looked it up <laughs> and figured it out. But we're we're confirming. Yes, um, this is the week of Blade's fifteenth anniversary because it came out December eighth of two thousand four. Happy birthday, Blade Trinity. <laughs> but before we dive into the meat of the film, I think um, so, listeners, we uh, as you know, we're coming up on 
almost our one year anniversary. And if you've been with us at the beginning, I know, woo, party celebration, party poppers. Not poppers? No. (laughs) I think we should work on a poppers reference in every episode. Jesus. So if you've been with us since the beginning, or you started, you listened to our very first episode, you know that our first episode, we did not cover a film. It covered um, us. We did a speed dating episode. Well, we are going to celebrate the new year and our one year anniversary. Uh, I think it will be episode 54, I think. Maybe 53. Something like that. Something like that. Uh, With a second round of speed dating. Uh, But obviously, we already know each other well enough. But that's also where um, the reader surveys we asked y'all to fill out come in. Um, We're going to go over some of that shit to see what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. But... We also want it to be a question free for all for you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to do an ask us anything. So we're actually looking for things that you want us to talk about. So if you've got a topic that you've always wanted to hear us comment on, if you want to know more about us, basically all topics are on the table. And if yes. you like your question, we will read them. Yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous road to walk when we say anything's on the table because it could go into (laughs) sexual things but so you mean people have listened to the podcast over the last year (laughs) (laughs) i mean if they listen to our um our ginger snaps episode they want to ask me more about my cum fetish or if they listen to anything with poppers (laughs) but yeah we we kind of have carte blanche uh, over what we pick but if it's a good question if it's a fun question if we think it'll be a funny answer that will entertain you guys we're gonna answer it on the air Mm -hmm. so joe how can they ask us those questions Okay, so if people want to, you can always use the hashtag HorrorQueers on Twitter. But if you want to make sure that it doesn't get lost in Trace's constant stream of different Twitter exchanges, you can always send us an email at HorrorQueers at gmail.com, and that way we'll have it in perpetuity. I will say that's the best way to do it. Doing the hashtag HorrorQueers is totally fine, but I mean, we got a lot more survey responses than I thought we were going to get. So if this is the same way, it is going to be easy for Twitter responses to get lost in, lost in the shuffle. So um, yeah. you can feel free to tweet us, but it's not a guarantee we're going to see it. So make sure, uh, yeah, if you can, try to email us at horrorqueries at gmail.com. Yeah, and we will be taking those Ask Us Anything speed dating e questions. We're going to be taking those until about December 15th. And we have a very special January plan for you guys. Because it's since our anniversary month, we've got lots of fun movies to cover. And you just have to keep listening to us to figure out what those movies are going to (laughs) be. In addition to like a new tier being unlocked on the Patreon, we've got all sorts of fun December content coming up where we're going to talk about our favorite films of the year, (gasps) as well as our favorite films of the decade. And those are only available to patrons. And coming with the new year will also come a rebranding of all the Patreon tiers. I'm really excited (sighs) about that. (laughs) Yes, Uh, we've been (laughs) diligently working behind the scenes. We've got lots of fun stuff coming up. But uh, to do that, we have to get through Blade Trinity. (laughs) We do, and so do the listeners. So (laughs) if you've made it this far, (laughs) congratulations. Um, But if you made it through Blade Trinity, I think you can make it through anything. I just, I just, it's not that bad, but it's not good. That's the thing, right? It's not that bad, but it's really also not that good well here's the thing this is a campy movie but it's a movie that doesn't think it's campy and that's the problem i mean after going through what eight weeks of camp earlier this year it's just Mm -hmm. you really get an eye for what knows what it is but the issue is why cast like parker posey why cast Patton oswald why cast um is it uh john michael higgins in -hmm. this movie (laughs) And I, I forgot Higgins was in this movie, and if y'all don't know who he is, um, he is, along with Parker Posey, what, a staple of the um, Christopher Guest mockumentaries. Mm-hmm. So why do that, but then make this all so serious? Like, and then, well, I don't know, because there's jo- there are jokes all over this fucking movie, but they're not that funny. No, and I honestly can't recall, like, maybe our initial impression of this when we were younger and more in the appropriate audience range for this film, maybe our initial reactions were on point for like a 2004-ish time period, right? I don't know, man. No one liked this movie. I mean, sorry, critics really... Sorry, here, let's let's go through that. So, yeah, released December 8th, 2004 on a Wednesday. And th- that's right. I saw it on a Wednesday. I saw it opening day with my family. It was a Wednesday like a, in, a, in the school week. I was wow. so shocked. You guys were hardcore. I don't know what that was. <laughs> so, <laughs> released by New Line <laughs> Cinema, um, a runtime of 113 minutes, which apparently, though, um, it is the shortest of the three Blade movies because the first one's a full two hours and the second one's 117 minutes. Yeah. 
Okay. It's, yeah. I mean, this is the day and age of good, lengthy... Like, I remember the Spider-Man movies and the X-Men movies, which were coming out around this time, but Blade actually predates all of those, the first one. They're all around two hours as well. I haven't seen the first two in a while. I remember thinking the second one's my favorite. Of course, it's Guillermo del Toro. The second one has the best creature design. I would argue that the first one has the best storyline. Okay, I'll go with that. But, uh... This apparently yeah, was the first one to have the Marvel logo in its opening credits. Uh, like, you know, like yeah. the, the flickering of all the comic book pages. Uh, it's like tracing the timeline back to its source where like, oh, this is where things started to, you know, like Marvel started to take over the world. Here's a little like a timeline pinprick kind of deal. <laughs> it's so weird, right? Uh, I mean, basically, it's Marvel and Disney's world at this point. We just live in it. Well, so okay, here here we go. So this movie has a budget of $65 million, and it is the highest budget of all three films. But this is what also shocks me. So uh, New Line clearly had faith in this franchise because the first one mm-hmm. in 1998 had a budget of $45 million for this R-rated vampire movie. Yeah. Which, it's not crazy, because, you know, we we did interview the vampire a few weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago which... Also had a very inflated budget, but but that was prestige. This yes. is comic book adaptation. Yes, and I don't. I wonder if they marketed the first one though as a comic book movie. I feel like they didn't, but I'm not going to commit to that. No, it was very much like a violent action film. Just okay. happened to have vampires in it. And yeah, the second one raised the budget of 10 million, so it was 54 million dollars, and then this one is 65. But unfortunately. This is the lowest grossing film domestically in the franchise, but it did tie the uh, roughly make the same amount as the first film um, with a worldwide gross. It opened at number two behind Ocean's 12 in its first weekend. (laughs) I know. So this was a bad weekend at the box office. 2004, I don't think was a very good year for movies in general. Although listeners, if you dispute that, by all means, send us good movies in 2004 because I didn't really actually look at the slate. I just feel like I feel it in my bones. It was a bad (laughs) year for movies. (laughs) Like, in my bones 15 years ago, no good. You had it loose. I feel like the mid-2000s, I mean, maybe it's just the horror genre I'm thinking of, because I feel like the mid-2000s, like, it's, like, poo-pooed on a lot in the horror genre. Although 2004 was Saw. So, you know, there's that. Right. Yeah, when is your uh, beloved Texas Chainsaw? This is... Oh, three. Thank you very much. So, yeah, this, this is after Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. And she's much better in that movie. And I feel like one of these days we're going to have to revisit that because you have talked it up such a big game. I haven't seen Texas Chainsaw, the remake, in such a long time. I'm kind of interested to go back and be like, is it as good as you remember it? So I introduced former guest Jenny Nolf to that movie last year. Mm. So I did rewatch it last year. I still love it. I still think it's great. But I'm never going to turn down a chance to watch (laughs) that movie, especially so I can defend it. Okay. But. Well, maybe put it on the docket. Yeah, maybe we'll put it on the docket. I mean, there's nothing really. No. No, it's. That would be, well, kind of like this film where we're just watching it because we kind of just feel like it. Well, there's a lot of extreme homophobia in this movie. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so listeners, when we programmed this, we looked at it and we thought, you know what? What's a fun way to kick off December? Let's go with a thirst trap weekend. We'll just talk about Ryan Reynolds' body for like an hour and a half. And also, it's the 15th anniversary. Well, no, and, and Parker Posey and how amazing she is in everything. Except this, because it doesn't know how to use her. Uh, No, but she's good in the scenes that she has. Sure, if you can understand her behind the mouthpiece. That is true. I don't know, this this movie just, it doesn't come together in the way that I thought it did. But uh, yeah, there is some really startling mid-2000s homophobia nestled deep within our action comic book movie here, folks. So it makes it even more appropriate for the podcast, even though we didn't plan on that. Which, exactly. We I feel like we, even with last week with X-Files, I want to believe, you know, like we didn't expect to have such a heavy discussion over an X-Files movie. And I don't think it'll be a heavy discussion with this movie, although <laughs> you never know. But, you know, surprisingly fitting for the queer like you know podcast. Yes. Yeah. I just think it's funny that, you know, last week we did X-Files franchise and this week we're doing comic book movie. I feel like I'm really, like, taking you out of your comfort zone here, Trace. Uh, no, I mean, I... I mean, X-Files, yes, but this, I mean, I, I like the Blade movies. I like comic book movies. I mean, I own 19 of the 23 Marvel Cinematic Universe movies on Blu-ray. Ooh, I'm going to take a guess. One of the ones that you don't own is 
Thor The Dark World. No, no, no. I own all of them. I don't have, like, the last four. I don't have Avengers, the, the last two Avengers movies. I don't have Spider-Man Far From Home, and I don't have Captain Marvel. Because mm, I, okay. I, I, I bought, like, before it, uh, Infinity War was coming out, I, like, bought all of them in order. Because wow. I'm a stickler like that. <laughs> yes, and, you are. And I have them in order on my Blu-ray shelf um, under M's because I alphabetize my movies. So instead of like separating them, it's under M for Marvel and they're in release order. Well, there you go. Now folks don't need to write in a question for the speed dating episode about how you organize <laughs> your DVD shelf. Anyway, so this, anyway. this movie made $16.1 million opening weekend. It wound up grossing $52.4 million domestically over all of its shit, which... Which is kind of, like, that's a bit of a surprising amount of legs considering how ill-received this movie was and how low that opening gross is. I do think the release date of December 8th is odd. The first one came out in August of 98. Yeah. The second one was a spring break movie. It was March of 2002. Those make it's sense. Much better, yeah. December for this movie is just so weird. Unless they're trying to go for counter-programming, right? Like, The right. Faculty was released on Christmas Day. I mean, it also flopped, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes people want a feel-bad movie Which for is, the holidays. I mean, yeah, it's... So I was about to reference a movie that we're covering next week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not yeah. yet. You'll have to listen to the end of the episode for that. Save it in your pocket. I know. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's not great. But again, $65 million budget. So domestically did make back its money. But it made $76 million overseas for a worldwide total of $129.2 million. So it made its money back. But I think the, mm -hmm. I think this was always meant to be uh, the ending part of the trilogy. It certainly plays that way, doesn't it? It does. Although... <laughs> Did you watch the the alternate endings on this movie? No. Okay. No. I we'll, could not turn it off fast enough. We will talk about that when, when you finish your plot summary because there is this hilarious thing about one of the alternate endings because um, there are two. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. Um, anyway. So yeah. No one liked this movie. Uh, we're looking at a 26% of Rotten Tomatoes with a 4.42 out of 10. Audiences are a little bit kinder to it, 59%, uh, average score of 6.88 out of 10, but Metacritic, <laughs> critics, uh, here we go. critics are 38 out of, out of 100, and users are worse, with 27 out of 100. That is a very stark difference between that Rotten Tomato audience and that Metacritic user. I wish that Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic would do a user survey to see the demographics of who is like, actually doing reviews on their sites. Yeah. Or even I I wish that you could sort it. I mean, I know that now we're getting into analytics, like, ooh, a deep cut analytics. This is what people come to the podcast for, Trace. Yeah. <laughs> but I wish we could do analytics about like when people were marking it. Like, are people rediscovering the film? Are they going back? Or is this primarily from people who saw it when it initially came out? I think people on Metacritic like to tank films and stuff. So I think I think I think it's like a, mm. a fan base that just goes and like shits on things or, or raises the score, you know, the opposite. Right. So it's the internet, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, it's just the yeah. internet. I mean, you can't okay. trust people. I, I don't trust IMDb. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 no. Before we get to your plot summary, though, I did want to point out. So this film, everyone, uh, was written and directed by David S. Goyer. Now, he wrote all three Blade movies, and he is primarily known mm -hmm. as a writer in Hollywood. He has three directing credits to his name. <laughs> Uh, well, sorry, three other directing credits. Uh, the first one was a very small directed video film called Zigzag, which I've never seen, but it has nope. Natasha Leone in it, uh, which okay. is probably why she's in this movie. Yep. This was his first, like, major studio film that he directed. Yeah, because, you know, if somebody needs a big directorial feature, you should definitely hand them the third entry in, like, a giant action movie franchise. That totally makes sense. I think it was because he had paid his dues. Because, he again, before this, he written the first two. He also wrote the sequel to The Crow, The Crow City of Angels, and he wrote the Ooh. movie Dark City. Do not use that tone. Do not tell me you don't know what Dark City is. I know what it is, but I've never seen it. Oh, my God. Okay. No, I'm not going to be a horror gatekeeper. I'm going to merely encourage you to go and check it out. Although it is, uh, it is film noir, so you may not appreciate it all that much. Yeah. Um, oh, but important to note, though, with Dark City, he was one of three screenwriters based on a story uh, okay. by the guy that directed it. So, uh, listeners, Alex Proya. Yes, exactly. Listen, what we're going to discover is that David Escoyer is not very good when he's doing things by himself. He is mm -hmm. good when other people are working on things for him, uh, with him. Except, and this is the weird thing, he also wrote the script for, oh, no, also had help with that one. Um, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> he wrote the script for Batman Begins, but he co-wrote it with Christopher Nolan. 
Mm-hmm. And then he had story credits on The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, but those two were written by Christopher and Jonathan Nolan. Right. So he's written a lot of shit. He also wrote or co-wrote Man of Steel, uh, which I oh. like, but a lot of people don't. Mm-hmm. Batman for Superman, Dawn of Justice. Oh. <laughs> and this year's Terminator Dark Fate. But that one he co-wrote for sure. He didn't yes. just write that by himself. That's like three people, I think, also on that one as well. But... I wanted to bring up his directing credits. Um, so yeah, this is his first big one. The other two after this, and um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've seen these. I know of them and have not seen either. All right, so one of them is the 2007 film The Invisible with Justin Chatwin, where he like dies and he's like a ghost, but he's like invisible and his mom is Marsha Gay Harden. It didn't get good reviews, but I remember thinking, I was working at a movie theater when it came out. I think I just like walked in one day. I think it was fine, but it got really bad reviews. I feel like people also hate Justin Chatwin. They like, do. He shows up in movies where he's either an unlikable prick or like the worst teenager you've ever met. So it's not helpful when he shows up and stuff. I mean, I only really know him from Weeds. He's like in the first episode and mm-hmm. he's in the Dragon Ball Z movie. Oh, you didn't see the Tom Cruise War of the Worlds? Oh, yes. He's, he's the son, isn't he? Mm-hmm. <laughs> fucking terrible him and dakota so fanning should have died in that movie it's terrible <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's actually right around the time where i started to hate steven spielberg yeah uh, i totally get that so yeah and his other movie the last movie he directed was 2009's the unborn with um odette annabelle uh nay useman and mm-hmm. i have never seen it but i've heard it's terrible I'm not going to lie, I would have pegged you as having seen this due to, like, the time, the actress, and the fact that it's, like, a kind of schlocky-looking horror film. The only thing I know Odette Annabelle from, um, besides being the big bad in season three of Supergirl, she was the girlfriend that they're trying to save in Cloverfield. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's she's, like, she's, that's like, the girlfriend in a lot of stuff. Yeah. And she's 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 really good in Supergirl. Um, the season's fine, but she's good in it. Okay. Yeah. I had to stop watching after the first year. Oh, God, I love Supergirl. It's so good. And it's so queer. It is so queer. Yes. <laughs> ah, God bless the CW. <laughs> C- C- CW shows are so good. They're all very gay. <laughs> this is true. Okay. If you're looking for gay superheroes, this is your destination. It really is. And also Blade Trinity. Blade, yeah, I know. Homophobia needs. <laughs> 25 minutes in. Bam. Uh, okay. Bam. Let's talk about the plot of this film because it's it's something. It is something that is masquerading Wait, as a plot. Indeed. Also, we have not mentioned Wesley Snipes once since this episode started. <laughs> oh, was he in this movie? I, I thought he was asleep the whole time. Okay, I read a stat today. I think it was on IMDb, so it could be a lie. But apparently he has less than 100 sentences. In, he speaks less than 100 sentences, sentences in this movie. And that includes two-word sentences like Coochie Coo, which they are counting as a <laughs> sentence. Oh, dear. Yes, he is known as the daywalker in these films, but I think we should refer to him as the sleepwalker for this film because, I mean, he's a very... <laughs> That's super original. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm Hey, I'm nothing if not original with my takedowns. Mm-hmm. There's a very noted public feud between him and David S. Goyer, so the two of them did not get along very well on the set. And people's trademark trivia that they like to pull out of this is that in the scene where Blade is supposedly dead, he refused to open his eyes for the take, and they had to like paint on fake-looking eyeballs for him. <laughs> So that's actually where I was going to get with the alternate ending of the movie. Uh, Okay. Well, we don't have to talk about it any more than that. Yeah, yeah, Come back to it. Yeah, because it it is in the alternate ending. I don't think it's actually in the theatrical cut. Okay, because I was keeping an eye out for it, and I thought maybe I had missed it. No, and the the DVD has the unrated cut, which I believe includes this alternate ending. If you stream it, then you you won't get that, but it is available on YouTube. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the deleted ones are always available on YouTube. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. But yeah, so what's this about? All right, so, after an opening sequence in which a group of vampires hit up a pyramid in Iraq called the Cradle of Life... Oh, I was so... (laughs) I don't like the desert setting, like, this pyramid stuff. I I mean, nothing against it. I just don't like it. It just makes me want to go to sleep immediately. And I just, like, okay, Mm -hmm. Dracula's there. Yeah, the only the only time that I will allow the desert into my horror film is if we are talking about that one Resident Evil film. Ooh, because that one's yes. actually okay. Ooh, I hope Jonathan Barkhan and Matt Donato aren't listening. <laughs> because they don't like that one, and they love the second one. And as we all know, I love the third one. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
That one is a good one. Yeah. Okay, so they go to this cradle of life, and they're there to resuscitate a Superman, but you don't really know what they're doing, because this is just the cold open, and it's, like, but it, completely... It's all serious. Uh, like, the, the, this sets up a movie that's not the movie that we get. No, and particularly, this is our first introduction to Danica Talos, who is played by Parker Posey, mm-hmm. and it feels like they should have cast some kind of supermodel, the way that she's, like, strutting her shit, and... Yeah. It looks like it could be a science fiction film, like it could be taking place on another world because they're all wearing space suits. Yeah, it's almost like pitch black. Yeah, I don't understand any of the costuming decisions throughout most of this film, but particularly in this scene. Did you love how, I think, I guess it's Danica that does it when they flip off the sun because this movie is so cool. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, part of me, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, I guess she's flipping off the guy who deposited them in the chopper and then i was like no it's the sun yeah oh okay because that that's what vampires do it's gonna be this kind of movie folks yep. <laughs> but and that's you know it's kind of like james bond you know like uh, all the james bond movies kind of have their own feel to them but they all still inherently feel like james bond movies but they have different directors mm-hmm. all the blade movies have different directors the first two feel like very different styles of films mm-hmm. but they still feel like blade films they're complementary yes This one doesn't have that luxury. No, this one starts to feel like we're creeping into that territory where everything was edited, particularly horror films, were edited as though they were music videos. Like, over-the-top editing, but also montage, choppiness. Well, but here's the weird thing, though. The editor on this, there's two. One is Conrad Smart, who worked, who's a Goyer, like, fanboy, apparently, because he worked on ZigZag and The Invisible, and revenge the tv show which <gasps> keeps coming up on this podcast <laughs> revenge! but the other editor which he's second billing but i have to assume he's the main editor um is howard e smith who edited near dark the abyss Ooh. dante's peak and snakes on a plane which don't have this style of editing no no oh, none of them so do. weird i'm the very confused i mean we've had the discussion about having multiple editors and yeah. how and why that works but that that seems like an odd pairing to me. Maybe that's the case. And I also wonder if, because Conrad Smart, if his, I bet, because Zigzag was a small film, and he mm-hmm. Goyer just brought him on to be like, yeah, I have this big, giant, $65 million Blade movie, come edit, and then the studio was like, we gotta no. get another professional <laughs> on this. And so I just <laughs> wonder, I don't know. Can we get somebody who's edited a film, not just like a couple minutes of a short? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not shitting on anybody who has only edited a short. I'm just saying when you have a $65 million action movie. That's concluding a trilogy. You probably want to bring on a couple of people who have cut their teeth on more than a single short. Um, You want to talk weird credits too? Also two composers. One of them is RZA, who famously composed Kill Bill um, and also the movie Soul Plane. I think they're also a rapper. But yeah. the main score guy for this is, oh, I'm going to butcher it, but it's Ramin Jawadi, who okay. is a pretty famous film scorer, but he's also notable for doing the score for Game of Thrones for all eight seasons and the theme song for that. Yeah, okay. And Westworld. And what do you think I'm going to say about the score for this film? Uh, It's terrible. <laughs> It's terrible, and I can't remember anything except for, like, the shitty rap stuff that's going on. So I guess I remember the the RZA stuff. There's a lot of, um, bomp and 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 bomp bomp like, in character introductions, specifically in Jessica Biel's uh, subway fight scene when she gets oh, introduced. Oh, God, yes. Oh, I do actually make fun of that in my, in my synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, continue. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so we, we've got this dumb Cradle of Life sequence, and then we drop in on Blade, Wesley Snipes, and Whistler, Chris Christofferson, reprising his role from the two previous films. And they're blowing up a warehouse full of vamps, and we've got this dumb credit sequence intermixed in between. The, the fight scene's fine. The fight scene is actually not that bad, but it's ruined with these credits. Yeah, it's the closest, I think, that we actually get to the two previous Blade movies. It's yes. like Blade doing his shit, and bodies are going up in, like, the weird staticky flame kind of deal. Well, and he's got his cool little, like, uh, whippy blade thing, uh, which mm-hmm. he remarks on later. Yeah, it, it looks and feels like a Blade movie. Yeah. And then we move on to the highway, and it becomes a weird Fast and the Furious movie for a little bit, as he's killing people with UV headlights, and uh, it all comes to a close. Looks very cool. 
Unfortunately, it's an elaborate frame job because Danica has set Blade up for murder. So he accidentally kills a human being who is posing as a vampire who conveniently lives long enough to take out his fake teeth on camera. (laughs) And like chastise Blade for not being a very good vampire. And then he dies and turns Blade into public enemy number one. The vampire's master plan in this movie is so stupid i don't really get it so they they want him to go to jail Mm -hmm. so they can keep him hostage for drake but drake can really just go get him at any time yeah yeah this would make sense if this was the opening and we hadn't gotten drake yet right yes like maybe like they fail to do this i mean again i get it turn the public against blade which they kind of do when they show the news footage but it comes Mm -hmm. to nothing uh, yeah, it's almost like Goyer sat around watching Batman Returns and then was like, yes. yeah, that could work, hey? Hmm. It, oh, that's, no, that's actually not a bad reference. And Goyer's script is part of the reason why Snipes, like, did not enjoy, like, he didn't want to be on this movie, and so he just was miserable to everyone the enti- t- entire time. But yeah, apparently, I think he turned down a couple scripts, too, and then he still didn't like the one that we got. Mostly because he didn't like the characters that Jessica Biel and Ryan Reynolds play, because he didn't think that Whistler, uh, that Blade needed sidekicks outside of Whistler. Yeah, I can't remember, and I apologize, I did not do my research on this particular part. I remember okay. hearing very aggressive rumors when this film came out that, A, they were brought in to not only sex up the film, which they do, yeah. but uh, also to age it down to make it a little bit more teen friendly. But I heard a lot of people speculate that Blade was going to be out after this, and then mm-hmm. they were going to spin off the, oh, fuck, what are they called? The Night Stalkers. The Night Stalkers. So that these two would get their own spin off, either movie or series. And of course, it comes to nothing. Yeah, no, so, okay, well, I'll just say it now. So one of the alternate endings, (laughs) it's Hannibal and Abigail go to, like, this casino club, and they're about to attack something, and it turns around, and it's a werewolf. No, oh, God, no. (laughs) Apparently setting up a Night Stalker spinoff, where it would just be them going off and doing something. and So basically Supernatural with, like, a boy and a girl. (laughs) Kind of, yeah. Also, apparently down the line, like, I I think in the early, like, 2010s, it was originally, like talked about to cross the blade franchise over with the underworld franchise oh you know what i could kind of get behind that yeah um there's enough leather in both franchises to make that believable so in 2016 kate beckinsale said that a crossover sequel to blade trinity with the underworld films uh, had been in development but was canceled due to marvel studios developing a reboot of the franchise set in the mcu which as we know now has been announced with mahershala ali cast as blade Mm-hmm. It only took, what, 14 years? <laughs> yeah, it, uh, 15, because it came out 15 years ago on its 15th anniversary. Mm, no, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm sure you're right. But again, like, wh- why age the film down? Why try to attract younger people? Which, I mean, obviously it did, because my sister and I went with her mother. There you go. It worked. It worked like a charm, <laughs> Trace. But then I, I think it, like... I think it alienated the other viewers who were older who did think Blade was cool. And then they saw Ryan Reynolds and Jessica Biel in this movie, which I'm not going to bash Jessica Biel. But, like, I don't think her presence is something that fans of Blade wanted in this movie. No, she's not adding something that people who enjoyed the two previous films would. Like, in unless you're dialing your mentality down to the lowest common denominator and being like know what this movie needs this action movie for like red-blooded american males we need tits we need yeah. jessica Biel. it's something weird and also it's it's insulting because again yeah you lose chris christopherson 10 minutes into this movie mm-hmm. and then because of her character like making her his daughter it's like Okay, it, it's real dumb, but continue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it feels like a late series, like season six of a TV show where yeah. they're like, oh, we lost an original cast member, but we're going to bring in like a younger brother or cousin we've never referenced before. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <sighs> okay. So in a downtown high rise, Danica enters a secured cell filled with the bodies of young women because this movie likes to kill girls oh, wait also she's looking at blade like in a computer uh th- this is one of my like one of my first favorite parker posey lines and it's like um snidely with less like mustache twirling villain she's looking mm-hmm. at blade on a computer screen like in a security camera and she just goes 
Oh, Blade. <laughs> As if she's like Dr. Claw, just like watching Inspector Gadget through the computer monitor. God, yeah. Too bad she didn't like pound the table. <laughs> oh, she will later. <laughs> okay, so this is what we figured out. So she is Dr. Claw. She's Dr. Claw. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. She's the, the name is Mr. Blade Gadget. <laughs> I don't know. That's my Dr. Uh, Claw. I like the cat. It was better than Rupert Everett's Dr. Claw. Oh, ooh. sorry. I cannot contribute anything further to this conversation. I have not seen a live action version. I did. I saw it in theaters. But continue. It's yeah. Fine. See, we, and we then won't you wonder why I was surprised that you haven't seen shit like The Unborn when you're like, yeah, I saw Inspector <laughs> Gadget in theater. <laughs> I, I was a kid when uh, Inspector Gadget when that came out. Burger King had the best marketing employee because like, you, you know you get toys at Burger King when you get like a Happy Meal or whatever the hell a, a kids meal is called at Burger King. Sure, you would get a part of Inspector Gadget, like his one of his arms, one of his legs, his head, his torso, and you would have to collect them all to put them together. Oh my gosh, that was the marketing thing for Inspector Gadget, and so I collected all that shit, made my Inspector Gadget, and went to go see it in theaters. Aw, and then you got childhood diabetes. So it, sweet. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's a bad movie. It's really bad oh i'm not surprised by that at all <laughs> okay so danica goes into the secured room and there's a creature inside that we see morph in the shadows some dodgy cgi here man the first of much to come but what's not dodgy about this is when he transforms yes so we get a creature who transforms into drake aka dracula and he is played by dominic purcell he of Prison Break fame and now Legends of Tomorrow and something else? Has he I don't done know. Anything else? He started on The Flash and then he went to Legends of Tomorrow after that because he was a villain on The Flash. Yes. I've never found him particularly attractive. He's um nope. He's what my day job boss calls a tomato can. Sorry. A very <laughs> wide, stocky, like built person with like a, a neck the size of his skull. Right. Okay. But man, if when he came out of the shadows in this scene, if I didn't drop my jaw and go, holy fuck. Yeah, I didn't remember him looking this way. Like, I remembered him almost the way that you described him, mm -hmm. tomato can wise. I was like, yeah, it's the guy from Prison Break. He's he's short. He's stocky. Like, he's very beefy. And then you see him in this movie, and he is jacked and delicious. No, but he's not like... He's not swole, like he's not no. thick, but he is very, very gorgeous, and I wanted to jump all over him. Yeah, and I'm not going to lie, the fact that he is either topless, wearing extremely deep V shirts and leather pants was... Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Oh, I, let's just say I had to retire to the fainting couch a couple of times. Yes. Which is just my usual couch. <laughs> I'm glad you have, a, you have a couch specifically in your living room for painting. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> um, but I will say, unfortunately, this character is underused in this movie. And it's saying something when a Buffy episode uses Dracula better than your $65 million movie. Oh, yeah. This movie has a significant villain problem. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do with this character. And he's not intimidating at all. They also seem don't really like he doesn't really seem to know what to do with Blade because there are so many times where I'm like, why don't you just kill Blade, dude? Like, just mm -hmm. kill him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. So at this point, Danica says, hey, we we need your help. Your people need you to help defeat Blade. So at this point in the film, you would be forgiven for thinking, okay, we are setting up an epic climactic showdown where Blade has to take on the king of vampires. Yeah. It's going to be epic. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not epic. No, it's not no. the case. It's not the case. It and is not. We know that Goyer can like write a Blade movie. He's written two good ones. I don't mm -hmm. know what happened here. It's like he got the keys to the kingdom and then he didn't know what to do with them anymore. Yeah. It just seems like he's very confused as to how to structure a film or how to build to, like, a rising action. I don't know. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> okay, so the Blade footage of him killing this human being has been leaked to the media, and he's a topic of discussion on Bentley Tittle's late-night panel show. And fun fact, Trace, we've talked about gossip a couple of times. I can't remember if it was on the pod or if it was offline, but this guy, Bentley Tittle, the late-night talk show guy, is played by Eric Bogosian, and he is the smarmy teacher from Gossip. Okay. I've never seen that movie, so I mean, I'll, I guess I'll have to watch it at some point. 
Yes, I feel like I'm going to make you watch it at some point, but <laughs> maybe this you is will. a nice taster. <laughs> okay, I'll remember that. Okay, so Whistler is understandably concerned about this PR war being waged against them, and Blade is not. Blade couldn't give two shits about anything that Whistler says to him the entire time, which is awesome, because it's super interesting to watch. <laughs> Meanwhile, a vampire street gang attacks a downtrodden woman at an abandoned subway platform. I wrote Dowdy Jessica Beale. Like, why is she even dressed in this getup? It does it serve her purpose well? Like, does it? I don't know. I, I mean, I guess if she went down there in her like sexy midriff bearing outfit, like they would not want to rape her. I mean, rape apologists all the time are talking a big game about how shouldn't she be all sexed up because then she'd be asking for it whereas right. you know what is this poor mother with with her sack of groceries and her slight haunch what does she do to invite a vampire attack trace i don't know man well because she has the baby because they make a big deal about when to eat this baby i mean is that a thing we I haven't seen the first two films in so long, but I don't remember them ever being like, mmm, babies are delicious, nom 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 nom. Yeah, I don't think there's ever a thing about them eating babies, but I can forgive that, whatever. I'm more concerned about the fact that this is an abandoned subway station when there's clearly subways going through it. So I, I was confused by that, but you know, movie logic. Well, this whole scene doesn't serve a purpose other than to introduce her as a character. Right. You know, this is a big show stopping moment for Jessica Biel. It gets her to show off her fighting skills, which are fine. I think the, I think the fight scene's good. What ruins it for me is her one liner that ends it. Yeah. So these guys try to attack her. She, you know, whips off the costume. Oh, it's a big fake out. She dispatches all of them. And then at the end, she uses her bow to take out the last couple of guys. And Trace, what does she say? Uh, she says, scream if this hurts, Chica, which is what the guy said to her. So she throws mm. it back on his face, which, okay, but her delivery of it's really bad. Can you, uh, can you model it for us? I don't, let me see. <laughs> scream if this hurts, Chica. Like, it's just like that. It's just like, I don't, I don't know. I, this is the first line she has in the movie, and it's, I mean, minus she's her trying to be. She's trying to be, like, tough. I'm a tough girl. Yeah, it's... Ugh, okay, y'all. Scream if this hurts, Chica. She is not good in this movie, and a she's not. big part of that is the dialogue she's given, but she seems very out of place delivering all these lines. Yeah, there's just something about her. She's got the physicality, and the fighting is okay, but it always just seems like she's not a good fit for this movie. Yeah. Like they shouldn't have cast her in this role. It's a little weird. I mean, again, we'll get to some more of her lines in a bit, because there's one where she's explaining how she's Whistler's daughter that is also really weird, but it's also the dialogue is just really bad. <laughs> yeah, dialogue throughout this whole movie. Bad, 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 bad. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, oh, also, this is our, our first impression that she likes to fight with techno music, because we get to hear that on the soundtrack. So people really like to hate on the movie just for the choice that she likes to make playlists and listen to her iPod during fight scenes. That mm -hmm. never really bothered me that much. It bothers me in the one scene where you see her deliberately put her earbuds in because i okay so i have a bit of a martial arts background i took karate for almost a decade how has this never come out <laughs> on the podcast before uh listeners ask us anything january speed dating you want to know more about the karate send in your questions there you go the thing is, you would never willingly take out a sense like your sense of hearing you would need yeah that. I guess you would true. maybe listen to music like there's a scene where they're driving and she's listening to music in the back seat and you're like cool yes this makes sense because she's That's getting she's making her up. playlist yeah like it's a dumb character trait but at least it makes sense like you get yourself amped up before a big fight but you wouldn't then go into the fight and willingly say oh i'm not going to hear if anybody's sneaking up on me yeah, Come that's on. true. See, and what's fun, I didn't even think about that as a possibility, but it makes total sense. I was more concerned about the logistics of, like, because they're not wireless headphones, like, of just having the cords, like, mm -hmm. you know, from the iPod in your belt, like, get, I don't know, wrapped around Ooh, an arm or something when you're trying to throw a f punch. Yeah, yeah. Or even, like, oh, I probably just cut the headphones off because I was, like, arcing that bow with the light of half the sun on it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Cut to that a bit. It makes no sense, but makes okay. No sense. Yeah. So a police manhunt led by FBI agent Ray Cumberland, played by James Remar of Dexter fame. I think he's fine in this. I mean, he doesn't, again, do anything, but he's cool. 
No, he is a character in this film who then disappears for the entire back half. And yeah, until the very, very, very end. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's uh, another great use of character. So he zeroes in on Blade and Whistler's location, and this location is rigged with booby traps and data-protected computers that all go boom at the switch of a button. Doesn't help Whistler because he just gets killed, and Blade is captured and taken in for interrogation. And this interrogation will be handled by forensic psychologist Dr. Edgar Vance, who is played by John Michael Higgins. And I would love the line where he suggests that Blade's interest in vampirism, because, of course, everyone wants to talk about whether vampires are real in this right. film, which is super interesting for us in a third movie about <laughs> vampires. Well, the Larry King talk show thing, uh, it's like, why... Why? It works in the context if you're going to keep up this PR campaign, like Blades on the Run, you right. can't turn to anybody because people are actively looking for him. But they drop but it. it only happens in the beginning. Like, all of this police stuff, all of this public enemy number one, it only happens for these first couple of scenes, and then as soon as he gets rescued, it's dropped and it's never referenced again. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so Dr. Edgar Vance suggests that Blade's interest in vampirism is associated with sexual confusion and his relationship with his mother. And this is the beginning, folks, of where all of the homophobia shit starts to come in. So there's this idea that Blade is interested in vampirism because he's maybe queer. Okay, well, because they mention like, it's like the exchange movie? of bodily fluids, right? Is that, is that yeah. the phrase that he says? Like, yeah. I don't enjoy that conflation. Well, I mean, he doesn't gender it. But as we discussed in like our previous vampire episodes, you know, vampires vampires themselves are inherently queer, mm -hmm. and so any discussion about them like this is going to be like that. But yeah, the specific phrase of you know, oh yeah, he wants to exchange bodily fluids is just like yeah, I don't know. I mean, what is it when in porn or in life when um. <laughs> When you know, like, uh, you. I'm sorry. Are you asking about my sex life again? Any anyone? <laughs> I mean, if you've done this, by all means. But no, it's like when someone comes in your mouth and then like you kiss them and you, like you transfer the cum over to their mouth. Isn't there like a phrase for that? Oh my god, you're so disgusting. Why would I know that? Yes, it's called snowballing. Snowballing. There we go. Okay, <laughs> that's. <laughs> I thought snowballing was when like you come in someone's ass and then like the cum like comes out of their ass. No, I don't actually know what the term for that is, but no, the snowballing okay. <laughs> is like the mouth to mouth stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Snowballing. So yeah, ask it, it's us, ask us anything, folks. Ask us. That any. was the first thing that I thought of though. <laughs> Whenever I hear exchange of bodily fluids, I just think of snowballing. Well, yeah. And the thing is, is like when people would talk about AIDS back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean like in the 80s when people didn't really understand it quite as well, there was a lot of right. concern about fluid exchange, like bodily fluid exchange. So I don't know. The language here is specific enough that I was like, oh, this is setting off a weird ting for me. And lest you think we're reaching a, little, a bit too far, just keep waiting. Keep listening. Yeah. Yeah. As I said, this is just the beginning. Okay, so Vance and Chief Martin Vreed, played by Mark Berry, and most of the police force. I'm not sure if any police officer comes off well apart from our FBI agent, but right. uh, they're all presented as familiars. And if people have not watched the other Blade movies, familiars are the humans who serve at the behest of vampires. They're the Renfields, and it's basically at the, yeah. of, of the promise of becoming a vampire at some point, I think. Yeah, like a vampire groupie. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, they are surrounded in this police building. Every person here is presented as a familiar. And they dose Blade in anticipation of the arrival of Danica and her gang. So let's go through this gang. So we've got her brother, Asher. Multiple guest appearances on the podcast. <laughs> Callum, Callum Keith, Keith Rennie, Rennie. As you teased last week. Two weeks in a row, man. Like, we did not plan that shit. Well, this is what happens when we do back-to-back -back movies that are explicitly shot in Vancouver. Yep, there we go. Yeah. Uh, we've got, I think this is her name, Virago, or Virago, played by <laughs> Francois Yip. I have no idea. She's the Asian lady who doesn't get a single line of dialogue. I, I, don't even, I didn't even know who that is. I, don't, I cannot even picture her. She gets killed by Abigail at the body factory farm. Nope, don't remember that. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> Moving on. And then, of course, the final member is Jarko, who is played by wrestler Triple H. 
And if you want to know where your homophobia is coming from in this movie, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is this character right here who is extremely gay panicky and so worried that he might come across as gay the entire mm-hmm. movie. Yeah. Which is interesting. Okay, so if you think back to our episode with BJ on Phantom of the Paradise, where we briefly talked about how queer wrestling has become. Right. This is emblematic of, I think, what people thought of in terms of wrestlers who turn into actors, is that you've got to maintain that macho status. Right. Keep them fags away from me kind of deal. So... Uh, unfortunately, Triple H does not come off well in this movie, although he is meant to be a source of comedy. Well, oh, no, because he has a Pomeranian. And isn't it so funny to have this big butch wrestling man have this cute, tiny little girly Pomeranian? Mm-hmm. But also don't be touching me and don't talk about your butt. Or don't look at his dick. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. There's weird stuff with dicks in this movie, too. It's constant. But yeah, anyway. Okay. So before they can transport him anywhere, Blade is revived by Hannibal King, Ryan Reynolds. Okay, wait, wait. But this is the best thing, though. Okay, this is this is how Parker Posey knows what she's in. And granted, I'm sure, like, Goyer directed it is. No. <laughs> Hannibal, Ryan Reynolds bursts in through the double-sided mirror, and yes. the camera just cuts to Parker Posey, and she yells into the camera, Hannibal King! As if we're supposed to know who that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. like, he is this huge force of nature that has foiled her at every turn. Yeah, it's basically, and I would have gotten away with it if not for Hannibal King, <laughs> except that we have never met this character before. And then her, it's just, and of course she's yelling through her teeth the entire time, and it's just like, Carl, Carl. <laughs> I rewound it because I was like, that was too funny to not watch again. It's so funny. It's, it's super funny, but not meant to be funny. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. But again, you don't cast Parker Posey in that role. If you don't want it to be funny, and I'm not saying Parker Posey can't do drama, she can. She can. She's done but it before. This is, again, not a good fit for the actress that you have cast, because it's not serious in the way that Parker Posey can handle it. Like, this is an action movie role. Yeah. And you cast Parker Posey with weird, semi-asymmetrical, badly cut by a child scissor hair. <laughs> I like her hair in this movie. I think she looks like a badass. <laughs> I think it's meant to be punk rock. I don't know. I think so, too. But I don't have the punk experience to uh, comment on that. Yeah. Punk people. Get at us. Is she meant to be somebody? Anyway. So then we have this big fight scene. Yeah. So Hannibal jumps in. He jams an inhaler into Blade's mouth to wake him up. And apparently this causes Blade to get a big old boner. Because (gasps) when he ends up busting out, you can see a very noticeable dick outline in these MC Hammer pants. It, okay, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I literally wrote Blade stands up in those leather pants and he straight up has a boner, like as a nose. <laughs> yeah, did not remember that from a previous watch, kids. I, I mean, I think it's just the crease of the leather because it's the, they're so firm, but it's, li- I mean, it's like he's pitching a tent. Like, oh, right yeah. There. Yeah. We'll post some, some stills or something. <laughs> it really makes me wonder, though, like, is David Goyer gay? I don't know. I'm going to look that up. Because it makes me wonder if he's, like, pandering to the gays here. Because it's not a good movie, but there's a lot of things that I feel like, minus the homophobia, that gay men would like. Well, I guess, though, but then you have the homophobia. So it's no, like... I, I think what it is is that this is gay panic because this was de rigueur in action movies at the time, right? Like, I'm thinking of all these movies where you've got a burly, ultra-masculine men, like, beating the shit out of each other, and it can't get any more gay. But the people who are making the film think that it's, you know, it's super butch. Hmm. Think of all the, like, all the Arnold movies or the Steven Seagal films from, like, the 80s and 90s. Like, Predator, right? Where it's a group of men who go into the woods and they're super sweaty and ultra mask. But you're just like, yeah, I've seen that porno. In the outtakes of this movie, they're all fucking each other behind the tree. (laughs) Uh, Cocky Boys presents Predator. (laughs) Oh my god. We should do a Cocky Boys. Cocky Boys should make like, this probably like a vampire movie. We can just like do an episode of the porno. There is, man. I referenced it back in Otto. There you go. Okay, cool. Well, we'll just do a Cocky Boys episode one day. I don't know how we're going to do that, but it'll be an experiment. (laughs) And if you've forgotten, go back and listen to Otto, because it's one of our least listened to episodes. Yeah. So then we have this escape scene, which is fine, I guess. You also get another really bad line from Beale when Ryan Reynolds is like, I can't shoot around corners. And she goes, I can. I can. (laughs) 
<laughs> and guess what? No, you can't. Well, yeah, it's because her gun, her gun turns at a right angle, but it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what she's doing here. It's like she hits a pipe and the arrow goes off and kills some person of color who's an yes. extra in this film. She also doesn't talk a lot in this movie. Like, she has very few lines. She's almost as stoic as Blade is. Mm-hmm. Only not stoic. It's just like she's mute. Yeah. She, well, because also she shows no sad. Okay, so, I mean, we're jumping ahead here, but whenever Natasha Leone dies, she gets her whole, like, Darth Vader no moment. Oh, God, it's so bad. But she doesn't do that for her dad. Uh, well, she she has her, like, I'm sad in the shower scene. That's about that? Mm-hmm. Because that's tied to her flashback of, like, how she's Whistler's daughter. She has a little cry in the it shower. It is? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought that was, like, not... I thought that was later in the movie. Also, can you imagine all the straight boys in the audience when this was out? And, like, they're like, oh, shower scene! What? We don't get to see some tits? Ugh! Yeah. My hand's already halfway down my pants. Exactly. What am I like, supposed uh, to do with this half stiffy? But that was Jessica Biel's thing, though, is, you know, like, after, because she left Seventh Heaven because she wanted to, like, be taken, like, seriously as an adult actress. And so she, I mean, not, not an adult actress, <laughs> but a mature actress. So, yeah, she was, like, stripping in, like, magazines and stuff. And that's why she did Texas Chainsaw. And that's why she did this. But I don't think she's ever, like, show, done nudity in a movie. Oh, no, I don't think so. I mean, she does a lot of bare midriffs and tank tops and that kind right. of thing. Right. But, like, but that's, that's not the same as, like, that's what yeah. everybody did. That's what every CW slash WB starlet was doing to try to break out, right? Yeah. You get your hair done up and you show up in, uh, oh, fuck, what's it called? FHM or there's some other one. I don't know. Terrible, like, lads magazine. <laughs> I, I don't know any of those. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they get out of here and they're, like, confronted with the cops. And then they're like, where's Blade? And then he jumps down and he's like, forgot my sword. Yeah. Did you get the impression that they were trying to reenact the lobby scene from the Matrix and all of this? Maybe. Maybe. Because it feels like a really subpar attempt. Like, all that's missing is people running up the wall. In Iron Man 2, whenever um, Scarlett Johansson, like, breaks out of a, she's like a hallway fight as well, like, that feels mm -hmm. like it's ripping off this movie, too. But as we've discussed in, ooh, oh, in Jawbreaker, um, movies like to copy other movies. It's a thing they do. This is true. Yeah. There are no original ideas. There is only Blade Trinity. But this is this is Blade's introduction to these characters. And, like, do we, of course, because we don't know who Jessica Biel is at this point yet. Like, we don't know her relationship to anyone. No. We're just like, oh, Subway Girl. Yeah. And Ryan Reynolds has a line where he's like, this little hellion right here is Abigail. And then Blade just knows. And his response is, Whistler's daughter. Yeah. You're like, no, okay. <laughs> no, that is a big logic leap, considering Whistler has... Well, I okay, I couldn't remember this. Had Whistler talked about having a family? Yeah, I no, think he had first... mentioned having a dead wife. I don't remember a kid. They mentioned that in this movie because, okay, so so because Blade goes up to Abigail and he's like, "Hey, I thought Whistler's family died," and she's like, "They did, but he had me out of wedlock." <laughs> oh. And, and hey, I, I, he goes, she goes, uh, they, they did, they died a long time ago, but I came later. He had me out of wedlock. And then when I came, when I came of age, I learned about his lifestyle and I wanted to be like him and he was against it. And so I went up and did it on my own and blah, 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 blah. Oh my gosh. It's really bad. But yeah, no, I think in the first one they tell you his family died. And like, like that's how we came across Blade right. or something. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I felt like there was some repurposed footage of that first film or like they built upon it or expanded upon it. But I was like, I don't remember a daughter. But it's just like really like, again, out of wedlock, like no one uses wedlock anymore. That's not, unless you're like super religious. <laughs> and then of course you have some kind of banter here where Blade dresses them down for their outfits and like says like, that's not tactical gear, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm an old phony, and you youngins, you don't know what it's like these days. Yes. Back in my day, I had to f I had to walk uphill both ways to kill a vampire. It's... I don't... I, mm. <laughs> I, I, you know, you can almost understand Wesley Snipes' anger with this film, because it does feel like they are pushing him out in favor of these two. Oh, yeah, for sure. And appara apparently he sued Goyer and New Line. He claimed oh, the like, student did not pay... The well, they, he claimed the studio did not pay his full salary, that he was intentionally cut out of casting decisions and the filmmaking process, despite being one of the producers, and that his character screen time was reduced in favor of co-stars Ryan Reynolds and Jessica Biel. Yeah, I can buy it. I can, I can buy it. it, too. Yeah. 
Now, when he's talking about the money, do you think that was also when he was avoiding paying his own taxes? I, in yep, I was, thinking about, I was thinking about the exact same. Maybe this movie is why he wasn't paying his taxes, <gasps> because he had to use, he had to pay, take his taxes to pay for his life. <laughs> he's like, I can't afford the lifestyle to which I am accustomed to as Blade because of these youngins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so they take him, so they call themselves the Night Stalkers, and they take him to, <laughs> may have laughed out loud when they said this, they take him to the Honeycomb Hideout. Okay. <laughs> which I can only assume is also where they make that children's cereal with the bee. Honeycombs? Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the other side of the factory. They have like a joint rent share. It's very expensive to have a barge out on the water like that, so. Yeah. Okay, so here they are introduced to members of this team because this movie is a weird dichotomy thing where they want to have, like, this team versus this team and you're going to have this and we're going to have a like-minded version. These characters, though, are just introduced to be killed later so we feel bad. So there's, like, a reason for them to go get revenge. But Yes, but it doesn't care. work because we don't know any of them. No, I mean, Natasha Lyonne is wasted in this movie. But question, was she, was she like a known entity at this point? Because this I mean, is before she... Orange, is, Orange is the New Black, I believe it's after But I'm a Cheerleader, but I feel like only queer people know that movie. Also, all the American Pie movies, uh, oh, uh, right. Slums of Beverly Hills, like she's, she's a known actress. Okay, yeah, so she would have been known then. Okay. Yeah, um, and of course, Pat Oswalt's their cue, and here we have mm. another bit of homophobic dialogue. <laughs> yep. I think Ryan Reynolds is the one that asked him, he goes, have you ever been laid? And he goes, many times, with ladies. Yeah. It's no homo. No homo here. Oh, I did want to point out that the, we missed another um, kind of a funny, also homophobic line, but also a funny Parker Posey line. This is when she bangs the table, and it's after, like, they, you know, lose Blade, and it cuts to her banging on the table, and she goes, fucking Hannibal King! I should have ripped his bleeding heart out when I had the chance. Which, okay, Parker Posey. Sure. But then there's a part where uh, Triple H goes, they pretty much fucking ass raped us. And then she goes, yes. oh, you loved it. Yeah. So, yeah. Not important yeah. to, to hold, hold on to, but uh, more homophobic dialogue. No, it's like everything that comes out of Triple H's mouth is basically who's got the bigger dick, me or Ryan Reynolds, and also keep that dick away from me, but also yeah. stick it in me. And we were ass raped because, you know, that's the important thing. We weren't just raped. We were ass raped. Yeah. Well, that's that's the only kind of legitimate rape there is for a man. Obviously, yeah. Trace. Come on. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> okay, so this is when we get a history lesson from Hannibal on the origin story of Drake. And this is shot and edited like a music video. It sure is. Yeah, so we get this, and then it's followed up by a completely pointless scene where the original vampire struts his deep V leather clad ass down the street, hits up a goth vampire store, and just murders the two store owners. I why I remember I remember thinking why? the scene with the vampire dildo was really funny, like at the time, and it just, it feels so out of place. Like it also, for lack of a better term, defangs Drake because but on he's not. Thing. He's not intimidating in this movie. Like, okay, he kills yeah. these two, like, gothy vampire sex shop owners, whatever. Oh, wow. You can kill early 20-somethings who don't know that you're super-powered. It's, like... I'm trying to think of another franchise that has, like, done this where it's, like, a trilogy and, like, the villain is just, like, the weakest part of it. I mean, it's been done before, but, like, this is an egregious mishap on this movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that this scene is an attempt at witty, self-referential, metatextual humor, where it's like, look at what vampires have been reduced to. They are now novelty items in a joke shop. Right. And to prove that this film still has the bite, we're going to have him come in here and he's just going to brutally slaughter these two. Except that it comes across more like a Dracula 2000 outtake right yeah it it feels out of place even in this movie which is already stupid enough yeah and honestly i don't understand why this scene is in here it's never referenced again it's literally just to introduce him as a person who will kill but we've already seen that because when parker Posey goes in to see him he's got bodies all around him so yeah it's just dumb it's dumb all right so uh hannibal explains that danica is preparing for the vampire final solution which uh again semantics final <laughs> solution really <laughs> it's so dumb no it's it's fucking offensive is what it is like the final solution 
in the world will always be associated with the genocide of Jewish people in the Second World War. That is what the final solution refers to. Oh, so. shit. I didn't even like, oh, oh, sorry. My history skills are clearly not sharpened enough. Did not realize that. Uh, yeah, that, what the fuck movie? It's a shorthand way of being like, oh, this is how we're going to wipe out a group. But also, do I want to be thinking about the Holocaust in my Blade trilogy movie? No, uh, come on. Oh, God. So, I, mm. not good. Okay, so they have a countermeasure. So the Night Stalkers have something called Daystar. Oh. I know. Which is a virus that can stop the vampires once that's, and for all. That's the thing. This movie thinks it's so cool. and Like we've never heard of something that, <laughs> like, this will stop the vampires once for all. Like, oh, wow, that's an original premise. It's not as bad as a movie thinking it's really smart and not being smart, because I don't think this movie thinks it's very smart, but it does think it's cool. It's, it's like watching, like, uh, this is going to sound terrible, like watching a nerd, like, think he's cool <laughs> it's just like it's kind of sad and pathetic where you're like honey no 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 no. you're don't J just be you okay but i have a question this nerd has the nerd been laid and if so has it been laid by females i think about um do you watch american dad i don't i've seen like an episode or two i just watched an episode where snot one of steve's friends um he loses his virginity to roger the alien um okay but he thinks the it's a girl alien yeah yeah uh, well i mean he's a, he's he's a queer alien sure. um but he's at he's walking around the whole, the whole episode like acting like he's hot shit because he lost his virginity when in fact actually he lost his virginity to two stress balls and didn't realize it it's really okay. funny that that is what this movie is to me <laughs> <laughs> it's like a poser it's a poser yes this, this movie is a poser yeah it's a poser of the two previous films which are legitimately good <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, okay, so what they need to make Daystar work is pure vampire DNA that can only be acquired from Drake, which is super convenient, and I realize that I hate it when people say that, but it's kind of hilarious that this movie says, oh, well, in order to do this, to stop the vampire plague, we have to have pure vampire blood, which can only come from this one thing that we didn't know existed until the events of this movie began. Yes, uh, and they also just so happen to have just resurrected him. Yeah, yeah. Ah, ah, ah. Mm -hmm. I know it's 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 convenient. It's contrived by movie yeah. logic. You, you just, again, I don't need this movie to be to make a lot of sense. I just don't want something that says we need something from someone who we didn't know existed, but apparently we were working on this before. Maybe they, no, they, they didn't know where they were getting, they always knew they needed pure vampire blood. They just didn't know where it was going to come from. And then they got word of Drake being a thing. <laughs> I don't know. This, this is where I kind of want, you know, my alien resurrection. Like, show me a couple of failed attempts at doing something in a test tube or like an Erlenmeyer flask or like a, a mason jar in the freezer or something like that. Like, well, they're not we tried a bunch estimate. of different times and we couldn't make it work because we realized we needed pure vampire DNA yeah anyway anyway it's a, a moot point we actually get a bit of a fun scene we get a montage as they go and hunt familiars because of course they have to figure out where drake is and they don't have a clue and this eventually takes them to edgar vance the doctor he has a weird cult-like medical facility that is heavily oh. guarded we also get a slow motion walk down the street a la jawbreaker or as we learned uh this week the craft mm -hmm. yes thank you for everyone for correcting us I guess it's our bad for not realizing that teens have been walking in slow mo since. No, 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 no. It's it's not on us. No, no. We, we we said that we didn't think Jawbreaker was the first one to do it. We just couldn't think of it. And the craft may not even be the first film to do the slow motion walk down the hall. True, but it was before Jawbreaker. Yes, yeah. So montage, cool slow mo walk, and then they hit up Edgar Vance's medical facility. He's already dead. His identity has been taken over by Drake. As Hannibal alluded to, he can shapeshift into anyone he pleases. Convenient. Yep, sure. Because why not? You know, don't transform him into a bat or a wolf or something interesting looking. Just transform him into other characters. This is another thing, too, though, where, like, he has an opportunity to kill Ryan Reynolds, but instead mm -hmm. he just pushes him on the floor. Yeah. He doesn't even, mourn, like, wound him mortally. No. Hannibal's fine. <laughs> Which, again, at least give me some nothing character that's on their team that he can, like, crush their skull. So we can mm -hmm. at least see some kind of menace from this Dracula character. 
Exactly. Yeah. So what follows is a foot chase as they run around the city for a little bit. And then they end up on a rooftop. Drake has acquired a baby during this chase. And they basically exchange words. It's not very exciting. And then Drake throws the baby. Blade catches it. And Drake has disappeared. To which I say. And this is where we get one of Blade's 100 sentences. Coochie coo. Yeah. Coochie coo. Mm -hmm. It's worth it, man. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, I have in my notes. Cut to Abigail's remembering her dad telling her he didn't want this life for her. Then her in the Mm -hmm. shower covered in blood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that happens. And then we also get uh, Blade has a very cutesy conversation with a child because fuck my life if superhero movies don't always insist on introducing children for no reason. They also make... Okay, so Natasha Leon is blind in this movie, and yes, it's very much like the Oracle, the Oracle, like Oracle in the Batman comics, where it's you know Bat- Batwoman, but she's not blind; she's paralyzed because the Joker mm-hmm. like shot her. That's yeah. very much what she is in this movie. Yeah, but she's also a geneticist. She's a techie who's also a geneticist, and then she has this daughter who exists to be kidnapped. Yep, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, we figured it out. <laughs> 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 so uh magical genius summerfield who is natasha leon's character she's figured out the location of danica's blood farming facility so blade and abigail go out there because hannibal is uh in bed watching horror movies yeah so they go to this blood farming facility and they discover that homeless people are being kept brain dead and ziplocked as sustainable vampire blood supply which is kind of cool I think if we hadn't cool. seen this in the yeah. first film yeah, but I mean, I, it's still a cool aesthetic. Like, honestly, I had forgotten that we saw it in the first film. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, look at this original idea. And now I feel stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> whoops. It's only because I I remember being like, oh, I feel like we've seen... Because, you know, science fiction and particularly like space movies like Alien Covenant, right? They love to show here's a bunch of people in stasis suspended in the air for like as far as the eye can see. Right. But I only remember it happened in the first Blade movie because it's one of my favorite scenes because Blade goes into that underground place and it's gate kept by that really, really like orca fat vampire, Pearl. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. The first one has some really gnarly makeup effects. Yes. And, and even like that character is a throwaway character who exists solely to go Blade yeah. <laughs> and then just get murdered by UV lights. But even that character, that sequence is so much more memorable than anything that we get in this movie. Yeah, we don't have any really standout set pieces in this movie. I mean, it's more of an, a martial arts movie than it is a vampire movie. Yes. Yeah. And it, it, you're right. It's Matrix light fight scenes, too. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I think the fight scenes are fine. They're not bad. There's just nothing about them minus like their occasional use of weaponry that's mm-hmm. particularly stand out. No, it's a very generic action movie aesthetic. I would have rather had, we were talking about this offline, but I just recently rewatched Charlie's Angels because I was in the mood after watching the new one. And mm-hmm. I was reminded of how iconic all of the wire foo films oh, were. Yeah. And this movie doesn't have that kind Wait, of Wait, did that aesthetic. movie hold up? Oh, no. No! I mean, it's still a ton of fun, but all of the janky pieces clearly do not fit together. And there's some really weird Asian stereotypes that keep coming up. Hmm. Like, Bill Murray fights... Um, oh, yeah, in a, in a sumo suit. Yeah, and, and like, that's a, a thing that people do at business parties and corporate retreats and that kind of stuff. But it's still... They do a lot of, like, turning Japanese uh, and... Oh, I know. I had the soundtrack and I listened to that song a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it's just, it's, it's odd. Like there's a lot of very early 2000s stuff going on in that film. Okay. Yeah. Like this film. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they, they shut down this farming facility. Abigail kills Virago. Blade kills Chief Vreed. And uh, they call it a day. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, who are these characters? You don't even remember. (laughs) So they go back to the honeycomb. I don't, I the honeycomb hideout trace. We, we kind i know we kind of get like a semi-suspenseful set piece where oh there's a good shot um it's when summerfield like she's you know using her blind stick mm-hmm. to like walk around the room and there's an overhead shot of her walking by pat Oswalt and someone else's bodies yes yeah because these cool. fucking idiots left the blind person on guard duty while they played basketball and she's also reading to her daughter anyway so it's like she's not even doing her job Considering the way that this movie presents technology, like we've got all these fancy weapons, 
wouldn't you have a security system with an alarm that like maybe makes a sound if it gets tripped? I think there's a throwaway line about the security system being down. I, I could mean, be wrong. Or I'm sure that Drake is meant to be, you know, so all seeing, all powerful that he can just, you know, jump over something and get inside. But yeah. it, it's still it just seems like these people are presented as stupid. But anyway, so they kill everyone except for Ryan Reynolds and the girl. And the girl in a weird aliens homage where she goes into yes. the vent. Ugh, she should have been killed. She should have been killed. I mean, I, <laughs> they, they make an excuse as to why she's alive in a bit. But it's like, I feel like Goyer wrote that after the fact to be like, wait, how do I make sure that they... What's a good enough reason to keep this girl alive? You think so? Maybe. You don't think he, like, retconned it? Like, he wrote the whole thing and then was like, shit, how do I get people to care? Maybe I should put in a little girl. Oh, you know what? That's it. You're right. <laughs> okay, so they come home. They discover everybody's body. Nobody cares about anybody except uh, Summerfield. Abigail has her big <laughs> meltdown. It's, oh, and, like, the camera pans out through the window. It's so stupid. I mean, y'all, poor Jessica Biel. I feel so fucking bad for her in this movie. <laughs> But this is my favorite line reading, and it's got to be, what, six of the hundred lines of dialogue? Because Blade just stands about five feet away, looking at her crying over her dead friend, and he just goes, use it, use it, use it. Yeah. <laughs> and was he saying, like, is it use her rage? Is that what it is? Yeah, like, use the pain, use it in the fight to come. But it's so dumb. It's so bad. It's yeah, I, I remember, I, I think I, I didn't write this in my notes, but I remember thinking, what? <laughs> use it oh wait no i wrote blade and abigail find all the bodies and she's distraught he tells her to use it and it's just a really dramatic sh shot of her screaming as the camera pans away <laughs> yeah i just feel like movies should know at this point don't ever give me a scene of people scream crying over it's somebody's bad. dead body because i always think of star wars no. What you do is you, you keep, yeah, exactly. You, know, you keep the pe camera in close on their faces and you cut back and forth between the corpse's face and the sad person's face. That's all you got to do. Yeah. I I'll feel more into that. I'll feel bad about that character. Editing. Editing. I know. Editing. Filmmaking. <laughs> That's a reference to I Know Who Killed Me, that episode. Yep. Oh my God. All we do is talk about old episodes now. You know why? Okay. Because these other, these other movies were more enjoyable to watch. It's okay. This is still fun because okay. we're about to get a very contentious aspect of this movie that I really, really, really like. And it, it makes the movie a bit more enjoyable for me. Are you talking about Pac-Man? No, I'm talking about the vampire dogs. Yeah, that's the name. That's the name of oh. the Pomeranian. Pac-Man. Oh, <laughs> I didn't get, I didn't hear that. Um, <laughs> yes, the vampire Pomeranian is the cutest thing in the world. Very and adorable. I love it. It's yeah. great. But leading into another homophobic joke. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we cut to Hannibal waking up. He's been imprisoned in this tower in the sky that the vampires are using as their lair. And he is awoken by Pac-Man, the vampire Pomeranian. And at this point, we have a big exchange about dicks. Do you have yeah. a specific line? All I have is Parker Posey telling them to stop talking about their dicks because it provokes her envy, which I kind of think is her most successful line reading. Yeah, it's good. I have that one. Um, I also have, clearly this dog has a bigger dick than you. And then Triple H goes, and when the fuck did you see my dick, fuckface? Yeah. And um, then I think there's a there's a fighting scene. Uh, they're torturing him. And then he goes, spit it out, you fucking fruitcake. Yeah. Fruitcake. <sighs> In the year of our Lord, 2004. Like, it doesn't even bother me anymore because I'm like, look, I get it. He's supposed to be this villain, whatever. Do I think the movie is homophobic? I don't... I don't think the movie's smart enough to be homophobic. It's it just feels tired. Like, hey, it does. what's a what's a way that we can try to convey that this person is a bad person? Let's have him use homophobic slurs. It eh? Yeah, I guess. And his death isn't even that good to be honest, so it's like a waste anyway. I still don't know why they didn't just kill him when Abigail shot him in the fucking eye with an arrow earlier in this movie, and yet he yeah. just pulls it out. Like, every other vampire goes up in a split second, but apparently Triple H is some kind of different vampire? Question mark? Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I they keep all it. these characters around to where it's like... Well, you gotta have your big fight scene. Well, yeah, but it's like... It's so many 
just randos getting killed in this fight, big fight scene. Oh my god, yes, I have comments about them. <laughs> okay, but wait, so, so this is when they reveal their plan for Hannibal, it's like how they're going to make him tell them the truth. Yeah, so they bring in Zoe, and they say, we're going to turn you into a vampire, and we're not going to give you any food, and we're just going to starve you for days on end, and then we're going to leave you with this kid, and you're going to eat her if Which... you tell us. My question is this. So this is the long con, I guess, right? Because she's like days. Okay, so they have days yeah. to get this information out of him. And hopefully Blade will not discover where they are <laughs> in the interim. I guess they were like, well, we did kill that tech lady. So he probably doesn't know how to find us. I I guess. I don't know. But luckily, <laughs> luckily, Summerfield left a posthumous video <laughs> telling them everything they needed to know. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. First, we need to see Abigail work through her pain by firing a series of increasingly faster arrows. So we get oh. like a minute of Jessica Veal just firing literally always incrementally faster arrows at this target. And I thought they were going to cut to the target and it would just be like the entire head would be covered with these arrows and instead she's got like ones that are practically off the board she's got ones that are like totally missing the heart <laughs> i was like oh wow so she's a shit shot but she's fast yeah she's <laughs> she's got an arrow that goes faster than 300 like miles an hour good for her yeah. she can't aim for shit i have uh yeah getting ready montage to some trance music yeah yeah because she loves 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 her music oh we're about to get a really bad moment from her in a bit when her fight starts but we'll get there <laughs> yeah okay so this is where we get uh summerfield pulling her randy meeks video so yes, she apparently that's exactly what i thought <laughs> i didn't even remember this but what i love about this video is that she leaves in this instructional video about daystar so how is this virus going to work also, Blade, I don't know if it'll kill you because we don't know about hybrids and blah, blah, blah. Like, who could care? She mentions in this video that Zoe is still alive, but she's not filming the video under duress. So it's like she knew that she would be killed, but also that her daughter would be kidnapped or left alive. Okay, I did not catch that, but oh my, I want to go back and watch that video now. Um, also backing track, backing track, backtracking to um third movies that have like where the first two have really good villains and then the third one just doesn't. Scream three. Mm hmm. Ugh. So Blade, Blade Trinity, and Scream three—that's your double feature. There we go. <laughs> Trilogies that suck. Well, they also get, get funny. They 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 get campy and funny, and <gasps> like the jokes aren't really that successful. Granted, Scream three is better than this. It's your Parker Posey. And your Parker Posey. Oh my god. <laughs> the scream three of blade movies oh my god jesus Ugh. christ Ugh. that is but amazing yeah, i i i did not catch that line about how she her daughter's alive so that's insane it was hilarious because i thought we were gonna see drake directing her but then i realized oh the content of this video is such like she's telling them how to kill him so it doesn't make any sense for her to be doing that after she's already been captured or before she's killed. But then I'm like, wait, why does she think her daughter's okay? I don't understand. I don't know. <laughs> so now we get a montage of literally just inserts. It's like a secondhand unit doing inserts of basically Batman level preparedness where it's like belts getting clipped and weapons getting... Yeah. Oh, this is the getting ready montage to trance music. Yeah, it's the sexy getting ready montage. Yes, it is. <laughs> Craziest <laughs> girlfriend. <laughs> uh, so this is where Abigail also preps her techno playlist because that is still a thing. Mm -hmm. They're committed. They're committed to the gimmick, at least. Yeah, it's a bit. We're going to see it through to the end. Techno, techno, techno. Thank you for coming out. And then we come back and... I kind of tuned out a little bit, but at this point, Danica has realized that Hannibal has a tracking device, and he suggests that it is in his butt. Yeah, there's a lot of that, and he's like, you know, Triple H is like, what? We're not he like keeps punching him because he didn't want to touch his butt, because, ew, gay. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, it's his left-ass cheek, it's his right-ass cheek, it's like, oh, it's, a, it's his most Van Wilder moment in the movie, where it's just Very like him being so. a petulant child. Yeah. And then, of course, he calls Parker Posey a cock-juggling thunder cunt, which is... Quite a good insult, I might add. Mm -hmm. Although it does feel out of place in the rest of this film because it's actually kind of fun and witty. Yeah, exactly. Like, you've never been this creative before. There is that reference, though, where he's like, um, she's just like all other vampires except her fangs are located in her vagina. Oh, I did like that one, too. That was good. Yeah, that was yeah. Really good. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, Teeth, a better movie. 
better movie. But okay, you know what you do? You actually put her teeth in her vagina, and you give us a scene with her having sex with the guy and biting off his dick with her vagina. Ooh, I don't know that you're gonna get that past the censor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying that would have been a better introduction for her character. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I will go with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is when Blade busts through the skylight and they start fighting and Abigail also is there and she frees Hannibal. So this is where we now get a litany of random 2000s era extras who get dispatched. Apparently there's just all these people hanging around waiting to run down various corridors and attack them. But you want to talk Matrix ripoff when it does the pan over Abigail's shoulders and then it, you know, it's her hand coming out and then she does Mm -hmm. the waving, like, come hither motion. I, I almost threw something at my TV. (laughs) Like, it was, I can't believe the gall to do something like that. It's so stupid. It's so bad. You know that Goyer probably thinks, hey, I'm paying respect and homage to one of the quintessential action films of the last five years. Yeah. And instead you're like, no, dude, you're just doing a shitty ripoff. But also the fighting in this whole scene isn't that great. There's literally a spot where it looks like Jessica Biel is in a slap fight with one of the vampires. They're not even like fighting. They're slapping like little girls. Mm. There's one part where Blade's, like, walking across a catwalk and a vampire just dives off, like, and misses him, but it's, like, almost, yeah. like, it's not fast. I mean, it looks like the vampire literally just dove off the balcony, like, to his death. <laughs> and there's a lot of guns. There's so many guns. Don't, don't make me go back to the Dr. Sleep <laughs> episode <laughs> where we talked about why do we need so many guns in movies with people <laughs> who have special powers. <laughs> My favorite thing about this scene is how the extras... Because none of these people are are characters. They're just literally bodies that rush to be dispensed with. But they're divided into three different categories by costume. So a third of them seem to be in some kind of business casual attire. So they're in like business suits with ties. Right. A third of them look like they're about to go to a rave. So we've got like really bright colors, like shorts and t-shirts and like weird accoutrements. And then a third of them just look like regular people. Like, they realized they didn't have enough extras for this scene. And they just pulled people off the street of Vancouver and said, Hey, do you want to come and be in this movie with us? Like, it's such a weird hodgepodge of different kinds of characters. And none of it makes sense. Like, why? It also goes on for a very long time. And also, where the fuck is Drake in this entire sequence, right? So we have this. And then we have a three-way, like, fight split screen. Uh, not split, but it's, it, it's cutting between the three fights. Because you've got Blade. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. We got to talk about the dogs. Oh, We got right. the dogs first. <laughs> Which are really funny. And their dispatching is also very funny. I do like it. I was worried about how you would feel about this. So we've talked a couple of times about how we feel when dogs get murdered. But they're vampire dogs, so it's... Yeah, these are vampire dogs, so... I, I don't really mind the bigger dogs, because like, I'm like, oh, they, they, they can take care of themselves. But it's when that Pomeranian just slides off, and it's like, Rah! <laughs> I kind of love it, because you see the other two dogs just barrel forward, like, and, okay, yeah. these dogs are dumb, and they just go over the side of the building, and they fall to their desk. When you see the Pomeranian try to stop, but it can't <laughs> in time, and it just goes, <laughs> And of course, that's Triple H's dog. So then we get a joke about like, what happened to your dog? Did you look in the lobby? Which is admittedly another decent line. It's kind of funny. I also do love when, um, so the, the, the little Pomeranian comes out and he's like, fuck me. And then like the two bigger dogs come out and he's like, fuck me sideways. Mm-hmm. I laughed. Yeah. It's not quite up there with fucks me gently with a chainsaw, but it's not. Yeah, but it's there. It's, I, yeah. I will tell you, it, it got a big laugh from my family in that theater in 2008, 2004. There we go. <laughs> So, yeah, then we have the the three-way split fight between Blake and Drake. Oh, yep. Blake and Drake. Blade and Drake, <laughs> Hannibal and Triple H, and then Jessica Biel is with Zoe running around. Is she? Like, I kind of forgot that Abigail was even in this because, like, Hannibal doesn't even... Okay, if we're being honest, in the sexism of early 2000s, late 90s movies, what should have happened is it should have been Hannibal with Jarko. It should have been Blade with Drake, and it should have been Abigail with fucking Danica. Yep, but exactly. that doesn't work because Abigail and Danica don't know each other. There's no tension in that fight. So instead, Hannibal gets both Jarko and Danica, and Abigail is just running around shooting all of these 2000s extras. Well, and she's stuck with Zoe because she's the woman. 
and yeah. she has to be motherly to this little girl who should have been killed anyway. Mm. And th- that's it. Like, oh, it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Not well, only the child like, should have been a vampire. Ooh. Up them fucking stakes. Oh, we turned her into a vampire. Oh because my god, we knew you were coming. And you know what? Then you let Jessica Biel fight this child vampire who's trying to kill her. <laughs> or it's like, oh shit, do we actually use this virus now because it's going to kill this little girl? Ooh, god damn it, Goyer! What the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? But that's le- that's actual drama. That's not comic book action. Right, for sure. We haven't like entered the era where it's like you know. Well, again, it's so ironic that he went on to do the Dark Knight. Well, I'm sorry, story the Dark Knight, co-write Batman Begins. Hmm. Hmm. But really, this is the end of the movie. Like, at this point, we're yeah. amping up. This is the big fight scene, and it is over before it begins. Drake changes back into his stupid form, which is admittedly not terrible. It's a it kind of a mix good. of CGI heavy makeup, like prosthetic work. It looked more practical to me than it did earlier in the movie. Like, it yes. looked a lot less CGI. Yeah. So it doesn't look bad, but unfortunately it means that it's more or less the end of Dominic Purcell and his admirable chess. Yeah. But he's barely in this movie. I I would bet you he has less than 10 minutes of screen time in this movie. But does he have more than 100 words of dialogue? (laughs) It's possible, actually. (laughs) Highly possible. It is. It's true. But yeah, so Drake gets, uh, you know, we have a like, oh, Abigail tries to shoot him and he catches it because he's so powerful. And then he just drops it and then Blade stabs him with it. All the vampires go, poof, Dawn arrives, and FBI agent Cumberland, because do we remember him? He's still <laughs> James Remar is still movie. in this movie. <laughs> Literally haven't seen him in, what, 45 minutes at this point? Yeah, because this movie's almost two hours long. So he shows back up with a SWAT team. Where the fuck have they been this whole time? <sighs> and they come in to clean up. We've got an orchestral uh, melodramatic music that plays. The camera pulls out onto an atrocious aerial shot of the city skyline. Looks like it was made on a Nintendo 64. And, uh, yeah, we discover that the body that Cumberland has discovered is not actually... Blade. It's not actually Blade, it's actually Drake. So he gets to see, oh, there actually are vampires... Because he, he basically he says, Blade, you're the new species of vampire. You're the future of our species. And so he does Blade a favor by mm-hmm. becoming him and therefore making the public think he's dead. And it's like, why? Mm-hmm. Why, why are you doing this? You are a super villain thing and you're terrible. Well, it's because he never actually had a motivation, right? Danica gives him the motivation. We woke you up so that you could kill Blade. And he's yeah. just kind of like, I guess... I'm not actually driven by anything because I'm not a character. So anyway, we get more terrible voiceover from Hannibal. He says the Blade is still out there fighting the war that never ends. And he drives off on a motorcycle. Cue that rap music and the credits. So just so you know, your secret CGI secret ending. So in the end of this movie, yeah, he's, um, you know, his body becomes Drake on the table. Mm -hmm. In the alternate ending... He just wakes up on the table as Blade and starts killing everybody. Okay. And it's there. So if you watch the ending, the alternate ending on YouTube, um, it, it, it like comes into his eyes on the autopsy table and his eyes, quote unquote, <laughs> open. <laughs> and he starts like fighting everyone. And it's the it's CGI eyes over his eyelids. So he agreed to do the fight scene, but he couldn't be bothered to open his eyes from a shot where he's just lying on the table. Apparently so, but I'm also wondering, because I didn't really watch it closely, but I'm wondering if we actually oh. get many shots of his face in the fight scene. So if Like you're thinking double. it's just the stud devil? Nice. Yeah. Okay. I could see it. I did, Before we like wrap up, I just wanted to say, yeah, so um, Patton Oswalt did an interview on a podcast about Snipes' behavior on this film. Mm-hmm. Okay, it says... Snipes reportedly caused difficulty during filming, including frequently refusing to shoot scenes, often forcing director Goyer to use stand-ins and computer effects to add his character to scenes. Co-star mm. Patton Oswalt alleged that Snipes would spend much of his time smoking marijuana in his trailer, and that he became violent with Goyer after falsely accusing him of racism. It had oh, also been... shit. Yeah. It has also been alleged that Snipes refused to interact with Goyer or his co-stars, and would instead communicate with them through his assistant or through the use of post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the annals of post-it notes in, in history, it's Sex in the City, the breakup with Burger, and then Wesley Snipes on, on oh, the yeah. set of... <laughs> I was like, the breakup with Burger, but yeah, I forgot the infamous po- po- post-it note breakup. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, <laughs> it's just... 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm just imagining now Wesley Snipes sending David Goyer a post-it note that just says, I need to break up with you. <laughs> I don't want to do this movie anymore. <laughs> I mean, it really sucks. Like, obviously, like, I wonder if tension. that's why he's not in this movie more than maybe he did actually have more to do and they just couldn't make him come out of his trailer because he fucking hated the guy. Maybe so. I mean, I... All of this makes it look like Snipes is the bad guy, and that may be the case, but it also may be the case that, you know what, he was the lead of this franchise, and they're bringing in two people to basically, like, phase him out to do their own spinoff, and I'm sure he felt pissed off about that. Oh, I would 100% believe that that was the case. Mm -hmm. I've gotten the impression that he isn't the easiest person, just from reports from other movies, but yeah, like, if you built a franchise off your back... Let's not fucking forget, he was making Marvel movies in the late 90s. The first Blade is 98. It's a couple of years before Spider-Man, like, really breaks out in 2001 and establishes this whole crazy superhero universe we live in. He is a black superhero. Yeah, it's fantastic. He fucking broke the mold. And then by the third movie, they're like, "Mm, you're passe. We're going to bring in two hot white kids and we're going to spin them off instead. Yeah. Like, that's a major fuck you. Which, honestly, may be why he called Goyer racist. (laughs) Mm, Because Goyer wrote the script. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And if we're to believe his claims that, you know, they were shutting him out of the casting decisions, Mm -hmm. that could also be a thing. Why not cast black people in these roles, you know? Well, here's the thing. Like, if you look back through Blade 1 and Blade 2, there are black characters. Like, this movie Mm -hmm. has, like, the police chief is black and... Well, I guess uh, that chick is Asian, but, like, those aren't characters. Like, they maybe have a couple of lines of dialogue. It's really Wesley Snipes out there by himself in this movie. Amongst a sea of white faces. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking, uh, I know you said we should start to wrap up, and know we're running a little bit long, but I did want to address something, because at the beginning of this episode, we talked about how we thought it would be kind of fun to do a thirst episode because Ryan Reynolds looks so good in this movie. Oh, Dominic yes, Purcell I'm sorry. looks so good. I mean, in we this don't movie. have to wrap up. We can talk about like this because it is an interesting topic. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll keep it relatively brief, but I just I did want to address. I said it somewhat facetiously. I mean, I'm not going to lie. The bodies look great. Yeah, no, Jessica Biel, looks Ryan good. Reynolds, Dominic Purcell, they look fine in this movie and there's a lot of skin on display in this movie but i think it's important to address on a queer podcast particularly how damaging some of that can be so i've talked a little bit not extensively but i have some body image issues would you say you have body dysmorphia I've never actually gotten any kind of like medical consultation with it, but the way that my brain tells me I look compared to how other people have described me suggests that I do. Mm -hmm. I've had people say like, you look good, you look fit, you look healthy or whatever. And when I look at myself, I don't. ripped. (laughs) Um, I have learned to say thank you for that, but unfortunately i don't see it so when i look at myself i often feel fat and bloated and even if i feel like i've had a good workout or or i've exercised or i've eaten well i still often end up feeling very bad about like certain parts of my body and that's not uncommon for people in general well but it's especially not uncommon within the gay community Exactly. So one of the potentially damaging things, particularly too, when it comes to things like superhero films, where we're seeing people who have superpowers who are super jacked up for these roles because they're meant to be playing gods or people who can save the world. So in the case of this particular film, you can go and find out I sent you this earlier, Trace, and we had Mm -hmm. a good laugh at it. So Ryan Reynolds gained 25 pounds of muscle for this role. He worked out for, what was it, three months? It was six days a week, two hours a day. And it was like 1,500 sit-ups, 1,500 to 2,000 sit-ups. So that's a gap Mm -hmm. of 500, by the way. (laughs) And then like he was doing heavyweight training and then blah, blah, blah. I don't know how long he did it for, though, like in terms of like months. But I'm sure like, yeah, three to six months sounds about right. Yeah. And this is also, he is an actor, so this is his job. So he undoubtedly had probably a personal trainer as well as a chef, because part of this is that it goes hand in hand with exercise and diet. But this is also not what he looks like regularly, right? So when we go to these movies and we see Chris Evans as Captain America and like his 
tits are practically popping out of these tight t-shirts. Right. You know, all of these bodies. It's different with women, where they're basically told you need to look skinny, but hopefully have like a bit of an ass and obviously tits. With men, the way that it goes is often you're meant to be muscly and lean muscle. So uh, if you look up stills from Ryan Reynolds in this movie and you see him shirtless, it's like an Adonis level body. Yeah. But that's also not sustainable at all. I mean, it, it, it reaches across even to just like, you know, women in the modeling industry and how the women in mo- that are, who are models are like stick figures. Mm hmm. And women look at them on promotional campaigns or they see them on the covers of magazines and they think, oh, that's what I'm meant to look like. That's the ideal. Yeah. And it's not true, right? But part of the issue is that women have done a better job in the last little while of actually combating that and saying, like, girls don't buy into this because beauty standards, cosmetics industry, like, it's all a big sham. And they're doing this because they can prey on our vulnerabilities. And... I think it's starting to move in that direction for gay men, but the problem is, and I'm specifically saying gay men because there's actually studies that suggest that lesbians are actually better, like they're they're more comfortable with their bodies if right. they're not looking like what these cover model women are supposed to look like. Gay men apparently do the worst with this. So we look at Ryan Reynolds and we think, that's what I want, that's what I should look like, and it's really mentally unhealthy. <laughs> and I mean, this is a generalization of like club culture too, but like, you know, you go to a gay club or a gay bar and it's like, there's a lot of bitchy queens in there that just look at you up and down and stare at you and it, mm-hmm. it breeds this culture of shallowness almost yes and i have a few friends that do legitimately have body body dysmorphia and i i don't have that am i 20 pounds heavier now than i was 10 years so i mean like i'm dating this episode but like i'm uh today like on social media they had this thing it was like oh post pictures of you from 2009 to 2019 yeah yeah and i posted to myself and i mean i think i look better today but my face is noticeably rounder my neck is fatter and i I said that because i'm like yeah i mean like i look fatter and i have a receding hairline I'm five foot eleven. I'm 170 pounds. I have no muscle tone whatsoever. I'm out of shape in the <laughs> sense that if I run for like 30 seconds, like I am literally exhausted. So I'm not blind to that fact, but I'm not fat. I'm slim, but not skinny because, you know, every time I sit down, I look, I can look down and I can see my stomach. But I always say like for me, like the level of confidence I always want to have is I can look at the mirror and like if I said like, oh, I would still fuck myself. Like I would still like have sex with me because I still find myself attractive. <laughs> That's my level of confidence that I need. I have that. Right. I mean, my biggest thing for me is like, in terms of like self-esteem is my receding hairline because I'm pretty sure I'm going to go bald one day. Uh, yeah, I feel you, man. Yeah, I, I, I'm worried about that. But while I'm not fat, while I am th- slim, I am aware that I'm, I've gained a lot of weight over the past, you know, 10 years. But I don't like to talk about that because I feel like if I do, then it's like, well, there are people that are that do legitimately struggle with their weight, you know? Mm-hmm. And also looking at you, who you have a much better body than I do in terms of just like muscle tone and also probably weight. <laughs> I, I'm sure like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you don't want to go out and like talk about those things, like quote unquote complain about it. I mean, I, complaints like sounds harsh, but but movies, uh, sorry, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, but, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> movies like this and like, like seeing actors do this to themselves or like Christian Bale syndrome where he's like oh, gaming yeah. and losing weight or Joaquin Phoenix for Joker. It's, it can be very damaging. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there's actually been quite a few academic and industry level uh, analyses. So one of the ones that I found that was really interesting was a piece from Psychology Today that just talks about positive body image. And it's actually very much in tune with what you were just talking about, Trace, which is you can acknowledge that there are things that you either don't like about yourself or that don't fit into the traditional standards of what society has said, like, you need to have a six pack, you need to be six foot one, you need to have a full head of hair, you need to have a deep masculine voice, like all of this socially constructed bullshit that we have said, this is what it takes to be sexually attractive and, you know, viable for other people. That's all made up. But unfortunately, we've internalized it. What this article does is it actually suggests that there are more significant issues uh, within the gay community with this. And one of the things that they recommend doing is actually working on your own positive body image. So as opposed to 
looking at Ryan Reynolds and saying, I don't look like him. It's looking at yourself and saying, am I happy with myself and trying not to compare yourself to other people or making that endorsement of appearance ideals. And apparently that's one way to avoid mental health issues with this because we're far more likely to develop eating disorders and depression and even suicide because we don't fit into this idealization. Well, that's what I do because even though I'm not like attractive to some people, as long as I look in the mirror and I said, I am so attracted to myself that I would fuck myself, I'm good. Like, that's totally the, the uh, level of confidence that I need. That, that may come across as narcissistic, and I don't mean I was going to say, <laughs> so what we're basically saying is you should be a narcissist and want to fuck yourself. And if you're cool with that, then we're cool with You that. should strive for that level of narcissism. It's like just touching the base of narcissism and not quite going there, because you wouldn't actually fuck yourself if you were, like, you know, a clone or something. But, <laughs> you know, you would, you would find yourself attractive enough to where if you weren't a clone, you would fuck yourself. Well, and I think also looking for positivity in yourself, like there's no harm in saying, you know what, I can be better. Like you said, you can't run for longer than 10 or 30 seconds. Oh, if that's yeah. something that you want to work on, then make it a goal and work towards it. Well, but... I want to work on it, but not have to do the work for it. Okay, well, we might have to strategize some other ways to get you there. But uh, I, I wanted to raise it because obviously we've talked not extensively, but we have made comments about how attractive we found the very obviously fit men and Jessica Biel in this movie. But also because it's now December and people are going into the dreaded holiday season where we typically tend to overeat because we're going to parties. We're having lots of sit down socializing. Yeah, that's why we program this movie. But also, you know, people make New Year's resolutions and then they feel like shit if they don't meet them. So I guess my advice to people, unsolicited and uh, not at all valid, is to just try to love yourself a little bit more and try not to compare yourself to other people because it's inherently unhealthy. And we love you. We may not know all of you, but we do interact with a lot of you on socials and uh, we love you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to talk about shit movies with you, or with us rather, <laughs> we love you. We love you for that because... Who else would have listened to us talk about Blade fucking Trinity for like two hours? I don't, I, honestly, I'm wondering if we have any listeners left. I mean, really, the, the last two weeks of episodes are going to be a real testament to see who listens to us because we haven't done episodes <laughs> this long in a while. This is true. But I th think we're going to wrap that up then and I'll move into housekeeping. Yes. But thank you for bringing up like sensitive subjects for you. I'm sure that wasn't easy, but yeah, that was great. And if people want to talk to us about their shit, um, you know, I mean, for lack of a better term, go ahead. Feel free. Mm hmm. Yeah, if you want to tell us where you're keeping the tracking device, left cheek or right cheek, get in touch. Or in the butt. In the, <gasps> in the butt. In the actual ass. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, all right. Before we announce what we're covering next week, um, if you want to reach me on Twitter, you can reach me at Trace Thurman. And I am at B Stole My Remote. That's the letter B. And if you're tweeting about the podcast, please be sure to use the hashtag HorrorQueers in your tweets. You can also email us at HorrorQueers at gmail.com or check mm -hmm. out our Facebook group uh, and talk to people on there. But remember, we are looking for those emails with those Ask Us Anything questions. Yes. Uh, if you want to send us a question for our speed dating episode, which will be released actually on uh, January 1st. So it'll be released on New Year's Day. Yeah, please send us those before November, uh, before December 15th. Uh, that mm -hmm. is our deadline because we have to, we're going to record around that time. Yeah. Of course, it is Christmas time coming up or the holidays, whatever holiday you celebrate, if anything at all. Uh, what we would love to get as a present are iTunes reviews. Yay. Go leave us some five-star reviews on iTunes. <laughs> and if you want even more content, please visit our Patreon page. Oh, yeah. So if you don't want to leave us a review, you can give us money um, at Patreon. Mm -hmm. Patreon.com slash HorrorQueers. Uh, you can sign up for exclusive bonus episodes covering recent horror films like Dr. Sleep and Primal. I can almost guarantee mm. Primal won't get us any new patrons, but it's a funny episode nonetheless. <laughs> yes, if you want to talk more about uh, <laughs> appearance ideals, you can listen to Trace talk about his grooming habits. Oh, yes, I forgot my butt. Yeah, I talk about my butt a lot in Primal. It's, uh, it's fun. Mm -hmm. But... Joe, we also kind of have a similar fun movie next week. Uh, I don't think there's really any queerness in it except for the inherent bitchiness. So what are we talking about next week? So we are going full festive and we are going to be watching Black Christmas. But there is a big caveat. We're not watching the original, a.k.a. the good one from 1974. We're going to watch the bad one. So the remake of Black Christmas from a couple years ago. Do you remember why we're talking about that movie, Joe? So, we are going to be covering the new Black Christmas, which is coming out around the same time in theaters. So that's the Sophia Tikal film that you and I are both 
cautiously apprehensive about, but uh, yeah. it's also because the original film is celebrating its 45th anniversary in a week's time. Yeah, December's a big Black Christmas time for us. So yeah, um, we're not going to discuss the original, although I'm sure it'll come up in next week's episode, but we are going to discuss the 2006 remake because... That episode will release the same time the new remake comes out um, on Friday, mm. December 13th. And then the 45th anniversary of the original is the week after that. So it's just a big black Christmas time for horror queers. And uh, I did rewatch this remake two years ago and I still didn't like it that much. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk about all the divas in this cast. And I'm not excited to talk about the flesh cookies. Or the jaundice. Um, yeah. But... <laughs> We'll cut it off from there and we'll save it for next week. And mm -hmm. on that note, we can cross out Blade Trinity. <laughs> and cross out Horror Queers. SCP archives, weekly full cast storytelling, horror queers, genre commentary from an LGBTQ perspective, and the Boo Crew. For horror centric interviews, listen free wherever you stream audio and at bloodydisgusting.com slash podcasts. Get in, losers. This is the Lady Killers, a feminine rage podcast. I'm Jen. I'm Sammy. I'm Rocco. And I'm May. Our podcast is a tribute to the female-identifying killers in horror and more. Each episode will feature us, your Supreme Court of female murderers, discussing our favorite lady killers, from your Julias and Jennifers to your Carries and Christines. We'll tell her story, decide if it's good for her horror, and answer the most important question of all, would we die for her? Join us on Thursdays as we pull on our sweaters, snatch our ice picks, sharpen our scissors, and honor the lady killers who live on the silver screen. No boys were harmed in the making of this podcast. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares. Like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams. <laughs>